Hello and welcome to the presentation on Pest Partners, a project to help museums and heritage organisations after the COVID-19 lockdown. I'm Helena Jeschke, the Conservation Development Officer for the Southwest Museum Development Team. I'm an accredited archaeological and objects conservator who has been working with museums across the Southwest in this role since 2004. Let me take you back to early 2020. A national lockdown was announced in March and museums and heritage sites were required to close. Many of these museums had no staff in attendance at all and others were operating with only minimal visits, usually once a week. There are about 400 museums and heritage organisations in the Southwest and most are volunteer run or have no museum qualified staff. Unfortunately, this coincided with the peak period of pest activity, when many adults emerged to mate and lay eggs, spreading infestations through the collections. This year, there were few people present to inhibit their activity or even monitor it. We knew we needed to act. We are Southwest Museum Development. Our role is to provide museum professionals, volunteers and trustees with practical hands-on support and development services. Our development program is focused around four key themes, audience development, digital engagement, sustainable volunteering and collections. We already provide training and online resources on pest management. Here are a few of them. They are available free on our website www.southwestmuseums.org.uk I'll show the address again at the end of this workshop. With museums facing extra difficulties, we wanted to do more. It would be helpful if we could provide free kits to help them with monitoring and treating pest infestations. It would be great if we could help a wider range of organisations normally outside our remit. With many organisations gathering pest data at the same time, it would be an ideal opportunity to gather data for scientific use. All this would take extra funding though. Fortunately, Historic England announced their Emergency Recovery Fund. We thought that this project was a perfect fit for their criteria. With a short deadline, we would have to work fast to secure this additional funding. But the upside was that there would be minimal delay in getting help to collections. Whilst designing the project, we kept several things clearly in mind. We started with making sure we matched the aims of the emergency funding. We identified clear outcomes and we kept focused on our key goals, not getting sidelined and keeping the needs of the project beneficiaries at the forefront of the design. We had to be realistic about what was achievable, balancing between the bare minimum and a more complicated project. We needed to be realistic about our capacity to deliver the project. We are a very small team. We also needed to keep focused on timescales. Emergency funded projects needed to wrap up by December 2020. We worked closely with the funder and took on board their input. And we also ran a draft of the project past people who weren't involved. This is a great way to find out if we had explained things clearly and if we had left anything out. Finally, of course, we wanted to give it a clear and memorable name. And so, with huge thanks to Historic England, Pest Partners began. It was designed to support up to 200 heritage sites or organisations in the region. They did not have to be a museum or even a charity or not-for-profit as long as they held a collection that was normally accessible by the public in some way, they could take part. Our aims were simple. We wanted the organisations to be more aware of the problems of pests and become more confident in dealing with them. We wanted to find local entomologists and encourage them to help. The data gathered would be made available for scientific research on the changing populations of pests in the region and hopefully inform our understanding of the impact. If the climate is becoming warmer and wetter, this is likely to change the range of various pest species. 
We also wanted to use the project to improve pest management for all. The pest partners would receive guidance on monitoring for pests, how to identify them and keep records of what they had found, and how to look for signs of pest damage. They would receive support when dealing with any infestations they found. For the longer term, they would also be helped to create an integrated pest management plan or review an existing one. Another important element was the need to increase the number of people prepared to tackle pest management. Many small organisations have struggled to find enough people willing to do this, and the project would create resources to help them increase the involvement, confidence and, hopefully, enthusiasm of a larger team. Meantime, they would have helplines for further support. We used our website and social media to spread news of the project. Historic England's press office was really helpful. There was interest from local radio and national press. 114 organisations expressed interest. Some had to withdraw because the pandemic meant they had fewer volunteers or staff were furloughed. 93 remained active as pest partners throughout the scheme from July to December. Museums, libraries, archives, churches, historic houses and others. Each pest partner received a monitoring kit containing blunder traps to catch crawling and flying insects and a suitable pen to mark them. An illuminated loop was chosen after considerable research that gave a clear view and coloured pens were provided to mark each pest as it was recorded. Full instructions were provided. In addition, we recorded short how-to videos with Lightbox Film Company from Hale in Cornwall, which are hosted on our website. The videos show how to set up the traps and where to place them, as well as guidance on examining objects for pest damage and wrapping infested objects for freezing. Once a month, the pest partners needed to check the traps. It's really important to do this effectively so that it is easier to identify the pests, so we created a video for this as well. We advised people to practice using the loop and to have good lighting. As you know, it makes a dramatic difference in your ability to see and identify the pest. We provided identification guides to the key species we were looking for. We chose 28 species which we felt were the most likely to cause problems, the most likely to be found, and the easiest to identify. We provided resources so people could record what they found and suggested sending in photos of anything that they couldn't resolve. The illuminated loop was chosen because it provides a good clear image to the naked eye and to a smartphone camera, so it is easier to record what has been found. The online survey was designed to lead pest partners through entering their data in easy steps. An ID number meant data could always be correctly assigned, and drop-down menus means it could be completed quickly for each trap. Pests found in other locations could also be recorded. For each trap, they could enter multiple choices with up to three species of beetle, moth or other as adults, larva or empty cases. Up to 21 species could be recorded on one trap. The number of individuals in each category is recorded and there is a free text comments box for other observations. Two thirds of the partner organisations sent in data reliably. Others stated that they had found no pests in their traps. The number of locations they monitored which had pests present varied from two or three to 57, but the average was about seven per organisation. The data supplied for each location, trap or other area such as a windowsill or an object each month filled one row of the spreadsheet. There were potentially 133 columns of data, including numbers and life stages of each species found, 
and free text comment boxes. For each trap or area, they could record up to 21 species in different stages, such as adult, larva, or case. The 28 types we chose to monitor included 26 pests, 10 that primarily eat plant materials such as seeds and dried plants, glue and size, as these pests often damage the surface of plant-based materials, as well as cellulose in the form of paper or wood. In addition, three of the species which don't attack wood can bore into it as the larva begin to pupate. Twelve other pests primarily eat animal material, such as skin, horn, soft tissues attached to skeletal remains, organic coatings, adhesives and residues. Some species cause damage while feeding on the mould formed on the surface of objects, or feed on other detritus such as fluff and shed skin particles. It's important to remember that many pest species will adapt and eat other materials besides the ones they are supposed to prefer. In addition to these 26 pests, we asked people to record the number of two sorts of spiders, the woodlouse spider and any other spiders. These are useful indicators of a plentiful supply of prey species which may not be showing up in the traps. In addition, the woodlouse spiders show that there may be damp areas nearby and or easy access to outside areas. This shows the number of individuals reported in the early months of the survey. Not surprisingly, there were, sadly, a large number of spiders attracted to the traps by the presence of prey species or just blundering in on their way through the area. Silverfish, woodlouse and booklouse finds showed that the relative humidity is too high in many of the collections. We quickly realised that we had to consider other factors besides the numbers of reported pests in each trap or area. With up to 58 beetles, 27 moths and 30 other pests in some traps, this would skew the data. For example, in July, there were 31 book lice reported, but from only six locations. There were 15 wood lice, but they were found in nine locations. And there were 61 furniture beetles, but in only three locations, one of which had 58 dead adults. So that one location was completely skewing the results. So we looked at the frequency of species being identified, rather than the number of individuals. On this graph, you can see the relative frequency of the 10 most common finds. July has fewer incidences because we had fewer survey entries from the pest partners. September, October and November had a consistent number of trap and area results in the survey. We took other spiders out of these results because they were so frequently found that they were skewing the data, but retained the woodlouse spiders because they help indicate either the presence of damp areas or the ease of access to the outside. We also looked at the way the occurrence of species changed across the southwest, from the west of England, Dorset, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, Cornwall, Devon, Gloucestershire, Somerset and Wiltshire. If you don't like spiders, please close your eyes for this slide. In particular, several museums have noted false widow spiders both outside and inside their buildings. This is not a cause for alarm, but a good reminder to wear gloves if you are moving boxes in undisturbed buildings and can't see where you are putting your hands. Another interesting find is the grey silverfish, a larger, hairier species than our native silverfish, shown for comparison. This was first documented in the UK in 2014 and has spread across southern regions. We have conducted an evaluation survey of all pest partners and further in-depth interviews with seven of them. They particularly valued the monitoring and ID kits and being supplied with free traps. They found the loop very helpful and the resources easy to use. They appreciated the support and found being part of the project kept them on course with pest monitoring. They suggested a step-by-step -step guide to identification would be very helpful. 
Some found the survey method a bit laborious. They are keen to network with other organisations. They would like to get others in their organisation to help and felt that more resources could help with this. What was our experience? As always, you cannot do too much planning. Setting up dedicated communications helped. The Illuminated Loop has been brilliant. Histrionics have been very supportive throughout. Lightbox Film are brilliant at making informative videos and coped wonderfully with keeping everybody COVID safe. Smart Survey has been really useful and we're fortunate to have a brilliant colleague, Rowan Whitehouse, to process the data for us. We could have done without another supplier letting us down at the last minute. It's surprising how many people don't read their instructions. We've had help from some lovely specialist entomologists across the UK, but we would still like more involvement, especially from scientists studying climate change who could use the data. It would have made things easier if we and our partners hadn't had to cope with multiple lockdowns. Finally, it's surprisingly hard to get clear photos of pest damage and we'd love to have more examples. We're still analysing the data and checking some of the traps with unclear specimens. Partners are planning how to deal with infestations or improve conditions before the next spring emergence and we are providing support. We are hoping to use the remainder of the grant funding to buy more traps and support more organisations this spring. We are continuing to help the partners implement integrated pest management plans and we're actively looking for more scientists who can use the pest data. In addition, we are creating further resources to help the pest partners expand their workforce with a card game and an animated film explaining the secret life of pests in museums. Please do watch our website to see how this develops and hear our news. Finally, a big thank you to Historic England for funding this project and to you for watching this presentation.